Okay, I'm going to talk about a um, geography problem that I started thinking about recently. And um, the problem is this. Given any particular spot on the ground, like this yellow dot, if it rains there, where does the water go? So um, in particular, what is downstream from that spot? And then also, conversely, what's upstream from that spot? So all the places where, if it rains there, the water is going to go uh, flow past that yellow dot. Um, so I started thinking about this recently, and um, I'm not a, um, a, a geologist or a hydrologist, um, actually a mathematician, um, but I looked into it and found out that um, uh, you can get a data set from the U.S. Geological Survey that describes this, and uh, so I wrote kind of a fun graphics application to visualize the results. So let me, um, I'm going to switch real quick and uh, give a, a demo of the application and then talk a little bit about what went into creating it. So let's see. Um, yeah, so here's the, um, here's the program. This is online at this address. I'm running this locally at the moment. Um, but uh, you can check it out if you want. So what's happening is as I move the cursor around, the program is drawing in blue everything that's downstream from where the mouse is. Um, and it's drawing in red everything that's upstream. Um, and the map's interactive, so you can pan and zoom around like in uh, any uh, web map that you'd expect. And it's, it's interesting to look at some particular areas here, like let's zoom in on New Orleans and uh, highlight the Mississippi River near downtown. And then zoom out, and you can see all the area that drains to New Orleans. Um, and uh, another area that's cool to focus on is Chicago. Um, if you zoom in, look how close the Mississippi watershed gets to downtown Chicago. In fact, it actually overlaps, I mean, how close it gets to uh, Lake Michigan. It actually overlaps a little bit there, but that didn't used to be the case. Um, uh, some canals were put in in the 1800s to connect the uh, Des Plaines River, which is this river right here, with Lake Michigan, and that's what allowed ships to transfer between the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes. And uh, that uh, gave rise to Chicago as an important transportation hub in the 1800s. Um, uh, another area that's kind of fun to, to focus on is um, uh, you go out here uh, to Montana. And uh, so this is the starting with the Mississippi way over here and then coming up uh, the Missouri River uh, just to see how far you can get over to the west before jumping across the Continental Divide to get to the Columbia River watershed to go to the West Coast. And that's, in fact, exactly what um, Lewis and Clark were trying to do in their famous expedition uh, 200 years ago or so. Um, another area that's uh, fun to focus on is um, uh, Nevada and uh, part of Utah. Uh, look at this. It has the property that, in a lot of cases, the downstream flow never makes it to an ocean. Um, this is what's called the Great Basin, and it's known for being particularly dry and, and having this hydrologic property. Um, uh, there are a few uh, streams and creeks there, but they just peter out. All the rain that falls uh, either evaporates or soaks in the ground or flows into lakes that have no outlet, like Salt Lake, and I think that's why it's salt. Um, so um, anyway, so let me say a little bit about um, what I uh, learned about surface water hydrology in order to create this program. Um, uh, let's see. So like I said, the data comes from the U.S. Geological Survey. There's a database called the Watershed Boundary Dataset, and it works like this. Um, it divides the country up into uh, regions. There's a nested hierarchy of regions, and I'm going to zoom in to the, the uh, smallest level, the one that's the greatest level of detail, and look at this one particular example. Um, so I'm going to focus on that particular region and then switch temporarily to a 3D view that I made with Google Earth so that we can see a little bit more about the, the shape of these regions. Um, so as the camera moves around here, you can see that um, the boundaries of these regions more or less follow local ridge lines. Um, these regions are about 5 or 10 miles across at this level. Um, and the bound their boundaries are very carefully chosen so that all the water that leaves each of those regions does so at one point. Um, and uh, in just a second, 
that polygon's gonna turn red, yeah. So the red polygon, you might be able to make out there's a stream in the middle of that that flows up, uh, this one flows north, and enters the yellow polygon at that one point. Um, so back in the map, um, there's that red polygon, and it flows into the yellow one at that one point. And uh, this other red one also flows into the yellow one. Um, and the yellow one flows into that blue one, and that blue one flows into that blue one, and then so on. Um, and this gives a relationship between these polygons. It's a many-to-one relationship. So every polygon has one that's downstream from it, and possibly several that it is downstream from. And so that means that you can think of these polygons as acting like nodes in a graph. Um, and there's uh, edges, directed edges between them that describes the flow. Um, and so that turns the whole map basically into a gigantic directed acyclic graph, which means that the original problem of figuring out what's upstream or downstream just translates into graph traversal, um, which is um, kind of a well-known problem and a lot of fun to code. Um, so once I realized that, I said, yay, I know how to do this. But it turns out there were, um, there were some challenges uh, with the data. Uh, first of all, the data set, you download this from the USGS, it's two gigabytes. It's way too big to do anything with interactively. And I wanted to make kind of a fun uh, web app like I showed you. Um, and so I had to figure out something about that. And uh, part of the problem, you can see if I zoom in on just one polygon, uh, part of the problem is that there's so many vertices in the boundary thousands or, or hundreds at least. And um, so that can be remedied because um, this is a common thing in GIS and there's a lot of good open source GIS software that will simplify a polygon and replace it with another one by dropping vertices in a way that retains most of the original shape. Um, so you can cut down the size of the data set. But remember, there's a, there's a bunch of these polygons. There's about 100,000 and they're all right next to each other. They share borders. And if you simplify them all, separately, um, you end up with regions like this where there's little gaps and, and overlaps. Um, and uh, so the, the reason for that is that in the original data set, each polygon is stored separately. And so what I um, ended up doing is to translate the data into a format that, that stores the shared border um, once rather than separately with each polygon. And uh, there's a format called TopoJSON that was uh, invented by the author of uh, D3JS that, that does exactly that. And uh, so by converting the data to TopoJSON and then simplifying, I got a good clean set of polygons that fit together well and um, got the size of the data down to about 40 megabytes. Um, and, um, and then I decided to use Leaflet.js mapping library to make the map. Um, Leaflet's a great library, I like it a lot. Um, but there's an issue in that the way it draws polygons by default is it uses SVG, which creates a node in the DOM for every polygon. And um, this is the Mississippi watershed here, and it's got about 30,000 polygons in it. And so the first time I ran this, the browser just crashed. <laughs> um, and um, uh, so I had to figure out a, a different way to do that. Um, so DOM manipulation uh, is slow, that didn't work. Um, it turns out that you can use Leaflet with HTML5 Canvas rendering also though. And so by switching to Canvas, I actually got it to work and it worked reasonably well, but it was uh, still a little bit slow. And so I made one more optimization and that was to notice that um, when the program's drawing these big red upstream areas, they actually consist of a bunch of little polygons. But I didn't really care about drawing the individual polygons. All I really cared about was drawing the one red blob. And so by doing a little bit of computation in advance to merge uh, all the polygons in, in each, each of these red blobs into one and just store the perimeter, it cut down the rendering time from being linear in the number of polygons to a square root, which for um, uh, big regions made a huge difference. And so that's what allows the, uh, the program to, to be as snappy as it is and made me really happy. Um, so um, I also made a mobile version just for fun that uses some slightly different optimizations, um, but most of the same ideas. And uh, so it's online. And if you want to check it out and talk to me about it, I'd be thrilled. Um, there's my contact info. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs>